is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in the study we've been doing for, I think, gee, uh, 13 weeks? This is our 13th yeah. week in the study of the letter of James. So we're going to pick up at uh, chapter 5, verse 1, right after Alice prays and asks God's blessing upon our time together. Hallelujah. Father, we just bless you, we praise you, we thank you, we worship you, we adore you. And Lord, we just ask that you guide and direct this Bible study today, and that nothing would be spoken that isn't from your, from you, from mm -hmm. your throne. And we just praise you and thank you, Lord. And let us use these studies to grow closer to you. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. And that we might know you all the more, Lord. Amen. You certainly know us well enough. Okay, we're going to start in chapter five, verse one. Um, and we're going to do that, but I do want to make a statement right off the bat. Because James talks about riches here. Why don't I read it, first of all? Okay. James 5, I'm going to read the first three verses. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted. And their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Mm. That's a strong, well, that's a very, very strong message from James. But it is, it's not about riches. It's about faith and love. Right. And you'll, I pray that you'll see that as the Spirit leads us as we go on here. The fact of the matter is, riches, money, is money's not evil. No. The Word of God says that the love of money is, is where evil lies. It's the root of all sorts of, sorts of evil. And that's the one thing we want to avoid is any kind of evil, not all sorts of evil. Yeah, we, right? want, we want to stay as far away from evil as we can. But you have to remember that as we are here in these last days, that Paul said one of the things that when he wrote to Timothy, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy chapter 3, one of the things that will define that time, and he's speaking about the church, is that men will be lovers of money. Yes. We need to be on guard. So that's what this is about, and that's what James was about. So remember this, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.5. That's the goal of our instruction. That's why we're here doing a Bible study. So that we will grow in our love and faith, sincere faith, by the way. And it's about correction and training in righteousness. We were made righteous by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. Fact. And that is indeed a fact. But we have to be trained in walking and living that righteousness. Because Paul wrote to Timothy again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he said, All scripture, all of these words that we're looking at, are God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So, Amen. you know, a lot of people thought, and I think we covered this when we first started this letter study in James, that there was some kind of friction or disagreement or a lack of continuity between Paul and James. And that's obviously not true. It's James and Paul walking hand in hand, hand here, led by the same Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it starts out, right, in, in that first chapter 5, verse 1, and he's talking about you rich, all right? You know, for, you know for a fact, you know as well as I do, that the world sees the rich, the wealthy, as the blessed. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are blessed. But Jesus made it perfectly clear that blessed are those who are poor in spirit, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you can see right off the bat that there is a true conflict between the world and the word. There's always a conflict. And it's always true. Yes. But that's one of the reasons that we do the Bible studies, and that we want to grow in our knowledge of the word, is because Satan, who is a liar by nature and the father of lies, 
and who is in, he is in control of what's going on in the world. I mean, he is, has power in what's going on. That's what John said in 1 John 5. We need to be on guard against that deceitfulness, on those lines, all right? And the only way you'll be on guard against the deceitfulness is to know the truth. That's right. As Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you shall know the truth. You're truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You want to be free. You want to be free. Okay. He also said, Jesus also said, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Mm. Luke 14, 33. You got to give up everything. If you're not your own, and you're not your own, because what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So certainly, if those things are not your own, Nothing that you own, nothing that you have is your own, all right? Everything belongs think, yeah, to God. Think about Joseph Yes. when he went to Egypt. I mean, so many people, particularly, they, they really don't understand. They think that he wanted to be a politician. Right? That's, what, that's what they point to when they want to defend their political stance. Yeah, well, that's not the case. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 39, and I'm going to read the first four verses. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. He was taken. He didn't, he didn't go up on a tab and get there. Mm -hmm. And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. The Lord was with Joseph. That's how he became successful. you got to understand what successful is, right? Yes. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he owned, he put in his charge. What did Joseph own? No, he, he was taking care of what belonged to somebody else. He didn't own any of that. He was a servant. None of that was his own. We are bond servants of the Most High God. God may entrust you with all kinds of things, but it still belongs to him, and you are responsible to him. That's where our attitude has to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then in Leviticus, I'm going to read Leviticus 25 and 23, verse chapter 25, verse 23. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently. Talking about the land, our rents. Israel, mm -hmm. for the land is mine. This is God speaking. The land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. God can trust you with it. God can give it to you for you to, to use to take care of, but it belongs to Him. You need to you need to understand. We need to understand, and this is so important that nothing is yours. Nothing, absolutely. If nothing. anybody would be His disciple, He said, "You got to deny yourself. You got to die to yourself." But it, it, it's not yours. But God will trust you with things because he trusts you to do the right thing. And then you are responsible from whom much has been given, much is required. The Lord desires that you be the steward of much, Amen. the owner of nothing. Mm, that's good. It's true. When, when God made man, when he took dirt and formed Adam from, from the dust of the earth, and breathe life into him, he put him in the garden. He did not turn, he did not give as a gift the garden to Adam. And he Adam did not own the garden. God entrusted him with the garden to cultivate it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work out very well. No. We need to be on guard because we want whatever God entrusts us with to work out well. That's what we have to be careful what we listen to, and who we listen to. Okay, so in, here in 5 1, he continues on. James continues on and says, Your miseries which are coming upon you. 
Now, that's a prophetic word for all time. You know, many of the afflictions of the righteous. Mm -hmm. The rich that James is addressing, both then and now, are those who trust in their own resources. One of the single most dangerous things that a Christian can come to believe is that he or she is a self-made man or woman. Mm. And you hear people boast about that all the time. You have nothing to boast in. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. You have nothing to boast in. If you have great riches, you have nothing to boast in. If you have nothing, you want to know something? You have everything that you need. That's right. Because he's made a promise to supply all your needs through his riches and glory. And we so, can boast on the provider. Absolutely. But isn't that one of the things that's most highly regarded in our world today? Being a self-made man or oh, self -made? Absolutely. It's very selfish. This is a very self world today. For men will be lovers of self. It's a selfish world. But bear in mind, that's a, that's a lie from the pits of hell. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do is own nothing, but have everything that God wants you to have. What I'm, what I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it should be obvious, especially with what's going on in the world today. The people believe that money can take care of them. That's right. And I don't think there's a bigger lie in the world than that. Listen to, listen to what's been written in the Word. Remember, whatever was written in the Word was written for our instruction, right? Mm -hmm. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own imagination. Proverbs 18.11. You may think that, but it's your imagination. Mm. The rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who have understanding sees through him. Proverbs 28, 11. Get your head straight. <laughs> get the facts right. Understand, and the only place you can get your facts right is in the Word of God. You know, there's all this talk about false news, fake news. Well, I know something, all that news is fake. This is this good news is the only news that you can count on as being sure and true. Just just remember this about the, the great problem is that when you have riches, and I have known quite a lot of wealthy Christian people, and I see this as a tendency, they tend then to trust in themselves and their ability. Absolutely. To you by what they have. It comes very natural. It does. Yeah. And natural is the right word. Exactly. Yeah. But think of this. Here's what the Lord said. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in a desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes, in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabited. Mm. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield its fruit. Those are, that's from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 to 8. Listen, this is true. The problem is if you have money in your pocket, you're going to trust in money in your pocket. You know, you might be better off not to have anything and have to go to the Lord for everything. We've been clearly, clearly warned by Jesus himself that riches are deceitful and will choke the word of God. I'll read Mark 4.19. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. That was Jesus and then telling in another parable, mm -hmm. sower and a seed, right? right? Have you not seen it? When you don't have anything, you can go to Jesus and he will supply everything, everything that you need. That's what it says in Philippians 4. He takes care of his children, of his bride. Because he loves us. That's right. All right. So James goes on and he says, your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you. Does this not ring in your head what Jesus had said? But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. Matthew 6 20. I mean, this is this is exactly what Jesus warned about, and this is what James is saying is happening. 
By the way, what Jesus says is going to happen. Absolutely. Okay, there's no doubt about that. And if they don't get destroyed, if your, if your riches, your gold, your silver don't get destroyed or stolen, mm -hmm. those who love money will not be satisfied by it. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes 5.10. And the rich will wind up throwing it away. In that day, I'm reading Isaiah chapter 2, verse 20. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship. Throw it away. It'd be, it'd be worthless. Well, the fact is, I mean, you're going to find out that, that you will come to a place where all the money, all the money in the world can't deliver you That's right. from some things. And the only hope you have is Jesus Christ. And oh, what a hope that is. Hallelujah. So as a kind of a last thought to meditate on this subject comes from the Apostle Paul, who said that we're to imitate him as he imitated Christ. Now I want to read to you from uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. Okay. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but dumb so that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. When you come to that place, you'll understand that the only thing that you have that is of any true value is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because everything that is good in your life is based on that relationship. It's built on that relationship. Yeah. Now, let me move on to the fourth, chap fourth verse in chapter 5 of James. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. To the rich who are proud, sinners, and double-minded believers. Paul said, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Galatians 6, 7. And then he said, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. That's in Micah 6, 8. So many people treat, I mean, I, I don't want to name names or anything because I certainly don't even have the power to do that. But here we are in a time going on in, around the world right now where so many people are experiencing poverty unlike anything that's normal because of this whole pandemic thing. And yet at the same time, it's certainly true and obvious that the rich are becoming richer as the poor become poorer. I mean, so many tech giants have, have just increased their wealth so phenomenally. Oh Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. Psalm 10, verses 17 and God hears. He hears the cry of the oppressed. He hears the cry of the poor. You know, the rich are the most likely to say, do you know who I am? Yeah. yeah right? That's right. Do you know who you're talking to? Yeah. <laughs> Remember the arrogance that James spoke of back in the fourth chapter of this letter, 416. I have known, I said I've known an awful lot of wealthy people. Wealthy Christians. I've even known a few who are still humble. But I can tell you the problem that I see that most are swayed by arrogance because they think that they have gotten their wealth because they deserve it. Pray to God that you never get what you deserve. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go meditate on Amazing Grace. What is it? And the Proverbs, is there a, a verse that says two things I ask? There are. Alice is talking about the verse that says two things I ask before I die. Let me not have poverty, 
and I'm paraphrasing. I'm going to not have poverty or riches, because if, if I have if I have poverty, I'm going to go out and steal what I need. And I if, have it here. Alice has it right here. Why don't I let her yeah. read it? It's it's uh, Proverbs thirty, verses seven, and I'll read to, from there. Two things I ask of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I, <clears throat> excuse me, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in need and steal and profane the name of my God. That's true. Uh, That's uh, Proverbs 37 and through 9, 7 and 9. It says, let me, let me look at it a second. I see something. Profane in any way, God. And I may not be full of denying you. Right. That's the danger. Because you come to that place where you say, well, you know, obviously, I don't I don't, well, I, why do I not? Yeah. But I, I work for it. Yeah. I got it. You know, it's, uh, I didn't. They don't see God in their life at all, of supplying any of this or doing any of this. Well, that's the natural state of man. Mm. Uh, pride, uh, you know, that's that's what is natural to man. That's natural to the natural man. And it should not be natural to the spiritual man. And one of the, one other thought I just had too is that with Satan being in control of the world, this is the power of the he's the he's the one who has the power of the world, right? The world, the, this present age, the world is in his, 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 his power. So stuff. people, where, where people are getting wealth, why and they and, and if they say it's from God, it may not be from God. It may be coming from Satan. He can he can make you rich. Well, I, I was going to talk about that. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about it right now. But the simple fact of the matter is, there would not be a prosperity message at right. all if it were not for that error. It's like God. You know, I've had people say to me over and over, "God wants you rich." No, God has made me rich, rich in the things that matter. Amen. I have I have an abundance. I don't just have riches. I have an abundance of everything that I need. Absolutely. Because he promised that he would supply all of my needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I don't have to have the money in my pocket or a paycheck coming to get the things that I need. If I need it, he'll supply it. Absolutely. The problem is, with mankind, almost entirely, and with the church all too much, we, we're not really good at distinguishing between our wants and our needs. Amen. But do remember this, because we're going to talk about this, and I might not get into this until next week. But there is nothing more deceptive than riches. Amen. That's right. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I've told the story before. Alice and I were visiting and spending some time at, at a meeting with a number of Christian businessmen in Sarasota, Florida, all of whom were extremely wealthy, and all of whom we knew and were good friends with. And we were sitting around having lunch, and one of the fellows mentioned something about, you know, how the world is, is just lying and lying and lying. And he said, well, you know, money is dead. Uh, and I said, well, you know, Jesus said the same thing. Money talks. Oh, that's right. He said, money, they, the world says money talks. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's true. I said, Jesus said exactly the same thing. Jesus said money talks. Mm -hmm. The only difference is he said it lies. That's right. <laughs> he said, beware the deceitfulness of riches. And believe me, riches are deceitful because they will make you feel safe and secure. When I'll tell you the only thing that can make you safe and secure of all alarm is a right relationship, righteousness with our God and Father. Hallelujah. So what what happens? I mean, you know, <laughs> let me just, I want to I read that, right? Because, like I said, Jesus said, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You, you got to be careful. You know, you, you got to be prayerful. And you have to treasure the word of God, because there is nothing more precious in your life than the word of God. It is far more precious than any silver or gold. It, is, it, is, it bears life. Amen. All right. 
And you, you know what? Generosity should be our heart. I can talk about, you know, don't pray that you don't get what you deserve. Mm -hmm. Because God has given us what we don't deserve. He has given us his love. That's why it's called amazing grace. You know, as we travel, so, so often people will say to me, God bless you. I say, he does. You have no idea how much he does. But he blesses me more than I deserve. I thank God that he doesn't give me what I deserve. For the wages of sin is death. And I, my friend, am a sinner. As we all are. As we all are. And if you think that somehow you have earned that grace of God, you don't have a clue what the grace of God actually is. Right. So this is why you should be so thankful for the gift of God. This is what changed the world in the life of Paul. Because in Romans 8, go read it and check it out. The whole chapter is a good thing to read. There's some homework for you. But he, he said, he looked at the cross and he said, if God loved me, if the Father loved me so much that he would put his begot, only begotten son, Jesus Christ, on that cross for me, in my place, what good thing would he withhold from me? And the only answer to that is nothing. That's right. He understood the love of God. Though I, I promise you, the thing that will free you from a, a connection, a enslavement to riches, is understanding the love of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. What time do we have? I think we're going to have to quit here in a second. So let me, I'm just going to read the, the next couple of verses, James 5, verses 5 and 6. We're not going to have time to get into them right now, but at least you'll know where we're going to be next week. And I pray that I hope that you know where you're going to be next week is with us again, because we, we enjoy your company. Hallelujah. James 5, starting at verse 5. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Well, those who have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure are obviously not those Christians who have heard and acted upon the word of God and paid the price. I mean, there's so much bad teaching out of Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter about faith. Now it's all about getting. Well, go read Hebrews 11 again, and look at it and realize that it's all about giving. It's not about what you get at this point. It's about what you can give. What God's, the faith in God, the spirit of God empowers you to do is to surrender all. That's right. Not to get all. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That sounds like a good verse. Yeah. Because God does love you. And his great desire is for you to have the abundant fullness of life that only comes from a right relationship with him. All right, so yes, time flies when you're having fun. We're going we're gonna to pick up right there uh, next week in James 5, reading 5 and 6 again. Okay, talking about what is it, what is it like to live luxuriously. Mm. I can tell you, mm -hmm. I've been there. I've done that. You can too, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that you are the font of all good things, that you are a loving Father, that your desire is to bless us. Your desire is not to withhold, but your desire is to give us abundant, abundantly. But Lord, that we would not be tied to the world and the things of the world, that we would have treasures that the world doesn't see, the world doesn't understand, that we would have that peace that passes understanding, that we would have just that and especially in these times, Lord God, that we would have such a peace that comes from knowing you. And Lord, our great desire would not be for riches. Our great desire would be to know your son, Jesus Christ, more and more and more. And that we would be more and more like him each and every day. That's our prayer. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Father. Well, thank you for being with us. God bless you. And Tell somebody about the love of Jesus. He loves you a lot. He loves you a lot. Hallelujah. Bye. Till then, God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.